So good morning. This is uh, the seminar, IAA seminar, web colloquium of the Severo Choa program. Today we have the talk by Jan Farbridge. Uh, he will talk uh, to us about the Orion Radio uh, All Stars, the new insight into the Young Stellar Object Radio Mission using BLA, BLBA, and ALMA. In 2007, uh, Jan um, earned his PhD at the Max Planck Institute for Radio Astronomy in Bonn. Then from 2007-2012, he was a postdoc at the Harvard Smithsonian. Since then, uh, external research associated. Then from 2012 to 2016, senior postdoc at the University of Vienna. And since 2016 at the University of Hertfordshire, now as a senior research fellow and senior lecturer. So thank you, Jan, for giving us this seminar. And you have 45, 50 minutes for the talk. Excellent, thank you. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. And it's, uh, 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 it's nice to think that uh, I'll be, I'm back in spirit in Granada. Uh, I've uh, always enjoyed visiting uh, the city. I, I went there quite often starting in my PhD. So that's actually, it's, it's a nice thought these days where we are all sitting at home uh, that we can connect in this way uh, and share information about our, our work. So thanks again for the, for the invitation. Uh, what I will be talking about today is um, something that has been around for quite a while. We will be looking at radio observations of stars and young stars in particular. And uh, since it's been around for a while, it, it hasn't uh, received that much attention uh, uh, until recently uh, when we have new observational capabilities and we can really take a new deep look uh, at uh, some physical processes in stars and young stellar objects in particular. The image that I have here on my, on my starting slide, I will actually remove the, the text for a moment, is actually a radio image at centimeter wavelengths of the Orion Nebula Cluster. That's basically the most nearby um, region of high mass star formation at uh, something like 400 parsec. Um, you can see a lot of detail in this image. It's actually uh, uh, noteworthy that you are not just seeing point sources, so the actual radio stars, but there's also extended emission, lots of complex structure. Uh, and this is something that we will briefly look into, even though we will focus on the, on the radio stars themselves. So this is, we will start out in the, in the centimeter wavelength range. Um, this is a direct comparison of the innermost region with an optical image from HST, which is on the left-hand side here. And this again shows you how even a lot of the complex structure that we see here, the, the remnants of the Orion Nebula, uh, are actually detected both in the optical and in the radio range, which is really a new situation. A lot of the extended emission that you see on the right-hand side has a direct match to features on the, on the left-hand side. Even though conveniently for dynamic range, uh, the trapezium that is very prominent on the left-hand side is actually more or less absent on the, on the right-hand side. So that's a little bit confusing in the beginning. But this is uh, the current view of our, uh, uh, if, if we uh, take the VLA, um, and we integrate for a long time. This is uh, almost 30 hours that went into this image. Uh, at the same time, this is the area where radio emission from young stellar objects was actually discovered. Uh, this is uh, an image from uh, some of the first observations that were actually taken with the then new VLA in the, in the early 80s. Uh, so you see this looks very different uh, in the, on the right-hand side here. We have this contour plot, so lots of compact sources were detected, but there's no extended emission. Uh, the dynamic range is much more limited. Um, that's uh, the difference basically comparing uh, the, the VLA capabilities at the very beginning to what we can do today. Uh, I always like to point out here that this is also a very instructive example for the benefits of spatial filtering and interferometry. In the lower left, 
uh, you see um, an image of the Orion Nebula, uh, also in the radio, in the in X band, so slightly higher frequency. Um, this is uh, in, a, in a different configuration of the VLA, so the sensitivity to extended um, spatial structure is, is much greater here. And we really need to filter out all of this extended emission to even see these compact radio sources, the radio stars um, in, the, in the ONC. Otherwise, we would just see the nebula. So here it's actually a good thing that we can uh, filter out extended emission by interferometry and we can remove the something like 600 Jansky of, of flux density in the Orion Nebula uh, to then see uh, and detect sources at the millijansky and submillijansky level. So this is uh, my starting example for how things have changed in, uh, in stellar radio astronomy overall. That's, I think, a good illustration. Um, there's really a renaissance of stellar radio astronomy going on as in, in other fields in, in radio astronomy, which is partly due to the fact that we have uh, new and newly upgraded facilities. Uh, the VLA has been upgraded. Uh, the very long baseline array has been uh, upgraded as well. Uh, we will look into this uh, a bit further down in this talk. Uh, of course, ALMA has come around uh, and this is, uh, has um, evolved its, its capabilities already. So as a result, we really have unprecedented continuum sensitivity and wavelength coverage that we can actually use, uh, particularly in this field. In the past, this has always been limited uh, um, by sensitivity, basically, because we had relatively low signal to noise detections and it was difficult to say what uh, emission mechanism is this. Um, there's a lot more we can, we can do in this regard with the greater sensitivity. And of course, this is really a first glimpse uh, of what the SKA will be able to do in terms of the methodology also. So we will be looking at uh, young stellar objects uh, in particular. What's the key here? I already mentioned this briefly. Uh, the, the key to why the situation is different now from what it used to be like um, several years ago is uh, essentially the arrival of, of um, wideband receivers. So we have a lot more uh, uh, continuum sensitivity, even though the observatory, for example, the VLA still looks pretty much the same to the eye uh, than it did before the upgrade, but it's basically a completely different observatory. Uh, I would make a slight side note uh, on this here uh, to, to briefly mention my second uh, uh, large project that I'm working on at the moment, which is also benefiting from wideband receivers. And this is actually something completely different. Uh, this is looking at uh, the Andromeda galaxy to look for Orion-like star forming regions um, in, uh, in, in this nearby galaxy where uh, the, the submillimeter array now has wideband receivers that for the first time actually allow us to uh, detect the thermal dust continuum of individual molecular clouds, which is really benefiting from the same developments that we also see here uh, for the for the centimeter continuum, but that's really a side note here, just to mention that this is a trend that is really going on in radio astronomy overall. Okay, uh, uh, let's get back a bit more to the to the physical context here. Stellar radio astronomy. What are we actually looking at? And then we will also take a closer look at young stellar objects. Uh, this is uh, one of the first. Uh, plots figures here in the in the tools of radio astronomy showing some spectra of, of radio sources. You, you see all kinds of different objects here. Um, in particular, you see as obviously the brightest observable source, you see the sun. The, these are these upper two curves here in this plot. And you immediately see that there's uh, one spectrum here for the quiet sun and one for the active sun. So there's already some activity going on here. Uh, the first characterization of these spectra is the spectral index. That's something that, that you've probably seen in many different contexts. And, and you see here that broadly speaking, we will have a situation where we have a, a positive spectral index for thermal emission, broadly thinking of this as free, free emission, 
ionized material and negative spectral indices for uh, non-thermal emission. In our case, this will mostly be gamma synchrotron to synchrotron radiation. This could be uh, other emission mechanisms. And of course, when, once you start to look at uh, objects in more detail, here's, you also see the Orion A H2 region, there are optical depth effects uh, that, that uh, come into play additionally. But that's broadly what we are uh, talking about. And we will be looking at the broadly the, the 10 gigahertz uh, range to, and then in the end also to, to higher frequencies. When we want to, if we want to uh, disentangle thermal and, and non-thermal emission, there are a couple of observational metrics that we can use. We can use the spectral index, I already mentioned this. Uh, often we would get uh, polarization information from uh, radio astronomical observations. That's of course a very helpful tool as well. Sometimes we see rapid variability and we can actually uh, detect sources with high brightness temperatures when we use very long baseline interferometry. So that's a, that's a fourth criterion here, which is also a very good distinction between thermal and non-thermal sources. All of these criteria actually benefit from more continuum signal to noise. Uh, so as you can imagine this, it, it, you would need higher signal to noise in order to get a good spectral index, for example, that is really, uh, that has a relatively low uncertainty to really disentangle um, positive and negative spectral indices, for example. So all of this uh, is actually improved by having wideband receivers. There's also a connection between radio emission and X-ray emission. This is something that is often discussed. Um, I will show this plot here primarily as an, as an uh, introductory plot. This is the so-called gudel benz relation, an empirical relation between the X-ray luminosity of a star and broadly speaking, the non-thermal radio luminosity of a star. And this uh, was originally re really just uh, um, constructed from putting all kinds of radio and X-ray observations on this plot and realizing that there was this empirical correlation over many orders of magnitude. This is not really fully explained. Um, this is uh, a, a couple of modeling attempts have, have, been, uh, have been conducted in the past and also uh, continuing to this day. There's definitely interesting physical information in here and it really shows an underlying connection between the two. So for now, let's, let's keep this in mind. Um, if we want to visualize a bit more for what this looks like, both in terms of the, uh, the radio emission and also the X-ray emission, it's always nice to look at the sun as our paradigm to make sense of this. Uh, and this is why I typically show this image uh, of the sun in radio and X-ray wavelengths. This is um, a VLA observation of the sun on the left-hand side and an X-ray observation by an uh, a solar X-ray satellite, Yoko, and these images have been taken more or less simultaneously in 1993. And you can immediately see that there's a connection here. And you can also immediately see uh, that the, 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 there's some complexity in this, in this interrelation of the two because there are similarities between these two images, but uh, there are also differences. Uh, what this image nicely highlights is actually that by combining radio and X-ray observations, we can really constrain the full sequence of magnetic energy release on the sun. This is from coronal activity. In particular, if you look at the, um, at this, uh, at, at the X-ray image, you see magnetic loop structure, broadly speaking. This is where there's hot plasma confined by magnetic fields. So seemingly you see these, these magnetic field loops. And on the, in the radio image, uh, you see the foot points of these loops. That's particularly evident for in these brightest radio sources in the image. And so that's where the acceleration is happening. That's where the non-thermal radio emission is coming from. And then you see uh, the X-ray emission as thermal X-ray emission from, from hot plasma as a, as a result. On the sun and, and on, on nearby stars, this even goes as far um, as uh, also leading to a, um, a correlation in the time domain because you really see the acceleration in the radio 
first, and then you see the buildup of energy in X-rays later on. This has been observed repeatedly on the sun where this is called the Neubert effect. And it has also been observed on, on nearby active stars. UV SETI is one example here in this plot. So it's actually interesting that even when we look at the sun, there are some expectations um, as to whether light curves in the radio and the X-rays may be correlated. There's an entire physical explanation underneath uh, related to this magnetic energy release, the chromospheric evaporation scenario. And this, uh, there has been some debate in the past to see, is this picture that we have of the sun also relevant for nearby active stars, for example? Can we observe the same physical processes there? That's why I included UV SETI here. So that's the, the, the broad context looking at the sun. If we now look at young stellar objects, we actually um, have a couple of multi-wavelength properties that we need to, to look into. This is actually a table from uh, a review paper by Eric Feigelson and Thierry Momel in 1999. And uh, it's, this is actually a, a good overview of, of what matters here because you, you see uh, the, um, the principal stages of low mass star formation from left to right. Uh, the famous class zero to class three sources, basically from protostars to Titori stars with a, um, a role of a circumstellar disk that is diminishing uh, uh, the further along you go in this evolutionary sequence. And what is interesting in this table here is that other than the infrared properties, we have three high energy measures uh, toward the bottom of the table. There's X-ray emission, and this is pretty much detected throughout this uh, evolutionary sequence. That's already interesting because it means that early on in the uh, uh, evolutionary sequence, we already have high energy processes going on. And then radio really is uh, just, uh, um, basically differentiated into thermal and non-thermal radio emission. And there it looks a little bit confusing. There are some question marks again. And it's again also a, a metric that is pretty much present early on in, the, um, in this evolutionary sequence. So we want to look at X-ray emission, thermal radio emission, and the non-thermal radio emission. Where does this actually come from? This is uh, a plot from the same paper. This is again a nice visualization to see uh, what are we actually looking at. If we zoom into an individual young stellar object, uh, here we see the, the, the circumstellar disk edge on. We have a source with outflows. There's often, uh, you will often find ionized material at the, at the foot, um, foot points of outflows. Uh, you would see thermal radio emission on these scales. This is something that in principle could fluctuate with, with accretion, for example. And it's really only once you look at the innermost areas that uh, we see various uh, magnetic field configurations, largely hypothetical at this point, even though there's also an, an artist's impression here on the, on the right hand side. So we could have solar like activity with uh, magnetic field loops rooted on the star. We may have structures connecting the star to the disk. So there's already a hint there that the energetics might be different from uh, a situation that we might find on the sun. And that's where the non thermal radio emission and the thermal X-ray emission is coming from. So some sort of scaled up coronal type activity very early on in the evolutionary sequence of, uh, of protostars. What does this mean in terms of physical scales? Uh, this is uh, just for the, for the broad context also for this project that I'll be presenting. If we look at the centimeter wavelength range, typically we would reach scales of something like 80 AU in Orion as a typical star forming region. Um, so we would basically be sensitive to, um, we, we would definitely not resolve the central object. We may, we may be resolving uh, jet structure, outflow structure. And if we go to a very long baseline interferometry, we really gain a factor of 100 basically. And we go into this sub AU scale uh, shown on the right hand side. So that's actually also really of, of physical interest. It will still be difficult to, uh, to resolve anything with the VLVA, 
in Orion in this case, uh, but we are really getting there uh, that there may be some resolvable structure. So we are really looking at the innermost vicinities. And this, I think, nicely highlights why both the VLA and the VLBA are very complementary here from a scientific point of view. What are the next steps? Uh, one uh, driver of this project actually really was to look at correlated X-ray and radio variability. We had observed one strong order of magnitude radio flare in an Orion source uh, published in 2008. That's uh, really an order of magnitude change. This source became the brightest source in the cluster for a couple of hours, then disappeared and uh, we have detected it since, but uh, nowhere near these, these flux density levels. This happens to be a source that was also detected in a non-simultaneous observation in the Chandra Orion Ultra Deep project. I'm showing the X-ray light curve here on the right-hand side. And it also showed a strong X-ray flare. And so the immediate question was, first of all, how often do these radio flares happen? An order of magnitude flare might have an impact even on your imaging dynamic range if you're uh, if you're unaware of it. And of course, the second question would be, what's the relation between radio and X-ray flares here? Do they happen at the same time? Are they basically the same phenomena? Would we see something like some, some sort of correlated activity that we can compare to the situation on the sun? Or is this may maybe a completely different mechanism, which could be the case if, for example, uh, magnetic field loops connecting the star to the disk are involved and that could look very different from the situation on the sun. So that's really um, two, these are two complementary looks, uh, views of the uh, high energy irradiation of, of the immediate surroundings of the young stellar object, the protoplanetary disks. There's a second aspect we can do and now that we have more access to the, the radio time domain given the higher sensitivity, we can also compare this to, to the infrared time domain. Typically, we would trace accretion variability in the infrared on shorter time scales. There was one case here where we tried this um, uh, in a source where uh, James Maserol had found a protostar with periodic accretion. So this had the advantage that we would basically know when to look and to see do we, do we see any differences in, uh, in the radio range. We did not find such a correlation here. Um, but of course, that's the, uh, the prototype example of a small sample if you're looking at one source. Uh, in principle, uh, having access to the radio time domain here might really uh, lead to some new insights also concerning protostellar accretion. So with that in mind, let's take a look at, at Orion. Uh, I thought that uh, since you've probably all seen images uh, of the Orion Nebula, I would pick a different one. And this is actually um, an oblique view of the Orion Nebula from a 3D visualization. There's actually a nice fly-through uh, uh, made at NASA that you can look at at this, at this YouTube link. Um, it's this embedded young cluster that we will now look into uh, in a bit more detail. Um, the data that I will be discussing uh, as um, uh, as mentioned in the beginning, are really coming from the VLA, the VLBA, and ALMA. And I'll present a first over, uh, overview of these, of the results that we currently have. We started with a very deep um, VLA C band uh, observation in the A configuration, minimizing the role of the nebula emission simultaneous, uh, um, su with simultaneous Chandra X ray observations. This the one main purpose of this uh, uh, first observation was to build a catalog of a deep catalog of radio stars in Orion. We found something like seven times more sources than were previously known. That's really an advantage of looking at Orion in a single pointing. You can look at hundreds of sources in one go. That's of course particularly interesting if you want to monitor uh, for for variability. That was uh, uh, one first experiment. We then also observed adjacent fields to, to, to make sure we, we really got uh, most of the population. Um, this is something, uh, this is a project that 
my PhD student Jaime Vargas Gonzalez is working on. He's probably on the call. Um, then we also obtained VLBA follow-up observations of all 556 VLA sources uh, that were detected in this deep image. That's something that is really has really only become possible due to uh, the upgrades uh, uh, to the VLBA, both in terms of sensitivity and, and correlator capacity. We'll get back to that. And finally, um, as a as a first look at the at potentially even higher energies, we also looked at continuum variability with ALMA uh, in the inner ONC. That's of course again difficult due to the nebula, etc. So so we, we'll look into this toward the end. So let's first take a look at what this means for the radio population. As I said, we are now looking at something like 556 different radio sources. And initially one might think, since this is a well-characterized young cluster, um, we have very good X-ray data, we have very good infrared data. So we have a pretty good overview of what the protostellar population looks like in Orion, particularly with X-rays, uh, where the nebula is not a problem in terms of bright extended emission and uh, extinction is also uh, very limited. But we actually found that uh, there is actually quite a mismatch between the radio detections and the infrared and X-ray detections. This sort of psychedelic plot here shows the innermost area of uh, the ONC. And uh, we see the, the radio sources in red, infrared sources in green and X-ray sources in blue here. And you see that sometimes all three symbols match up. And then there are all kinds of cases where we have just two bands or even just one band. So that's an interesting question. What are these sources? What are we looking at? Um, we concluded that uh, in comparison with these, uh, the infrared and the X-ray data, that most of these sources actually are radio stars. Some of them are uh, uh, too deeply embedded or are in bright, areas of the nebula that we do not see infrared or x-ray counterparts. So that happens. This flare source that I showed a moment ago is actually one example. Um, but we also uh, detect compact emission from, for example, jet shocks um, and uh, so non-stellar sources that are still related to Orion. So that's, that was actually an interesting first surprise to see uh, we are not only detecting radio stars here, the sensitivity is now uh, uh, sufficient to actually detect more than radio stars here in the inner ONC. We, we'll get back to that in a, uh, in a moment. As I mentioned earlier, we now have greater sensitivity, so we can actually uh, have a much better view of uh, spectral indices, for example. That's one example, one advantage of, of wideband receivers that you may even be able to get an in-band spectral index that the, the band is wide enough that from one observation, you can actually determine a spectral index. This is shown here also for the, for the inner ONC with the spectral index color coded from negative to positive. So we see a range of different spectral indices here, uh, including negative spectral indices expected for non-thermal emission and also some thermal sources with uh, red spectral indices here in this plot. This is something that previously would have required two separate narrowband observations to then construct spectral indices. And then of course, if there's variability going on, things would get more, more complicated. So that's actually uh, a nice advantage of having wideband receivers. And we have a much better look a much better view of, of the, the sample properties uh, with spectral indices. Additionally, we also have great sensitivity on short time scales. It's, so we are no longer looking at this cluster integrating for many hours and then we have a, a low signal to noise detection. There's actually much greater sensitivity even to, uh, to shorter time scales. The snapshot sensitivity really is very good. This is broadly shown in these two examples here. This is for two sources. One is in the upper uh, um, uh, plots and one is in the lower plots um, where I change the time resolution. So in the leftmost panel, uh, the x-axis is time in days 
So of course we couldn't uh, observe 30 hours in one go. So we had uh, these on, on successive days. So you see the five different observing epochs. So the first source um, pretty much was undetected except for one detection. This is this, this uh, single blue point on the plot. The, the red points are always upper limits. Uh, there's a similar situation going on for the lower source. And then the next panel shows the same data imaged at 30 minutes resolution. And then we go to six minutes resolution. Now this is shown twice, once with the actual uh, time x axis, and then once just as frame number to, to show this a little bit better. And you see there's actually a lot of, of uh, variability going on, even on short time scales. There's a, really an extreme case here in the lower panel uh, where there's a major flare hidden in this one epoch uh, that doesn't look very suspicious actually when, when you image the, the epochs individually in the first panel. All of that actually is, is, uh, has some interesting implications. What does it mean if you get an average flux density for this source? So you get some kind of nonlinear average across these observations, including upper limits. Um, is that a meaningful measurement? To what degree uh, can you actually cover these time scales? So that, that there are some some interesting questions here that we can now really address uh, looking at the at the time domain. Uh, and we got back to this question um, that was started by this one flare that we observed in two thousand eight, uh, because we wanted to know how often does this happen? How often do we find a source? that shows order of magnitude variability uh, in the radio in, in Orion. And of course, uh, Orion really is, the, uh, is a great target to, to, to answer such a question because you can look at hundreds of sources in one go. And you can basically see where do these events occur? Do they occur? How often do they occur? Uh, so that's, that was one driver of, uh, of doing this time sliced imaging. And we actually did find quite a bit of uh, order of magnitude variability. This is uh, one attempt to, to visualize this here. Um, I'm showing the source number for these 556 sources on the x-axis and any pair of, uh, uh, of photometry for each of these sources that has a variability factor of greater than 10, which is pretty much the bottom of this plot, uh, is shown uh, in this figure. And so you see there's actually out of these 556 sources, there are quite a number of sources that actually do show variability by more than a factor of 10, sometimes by a few hundred actually in the most extreme case. Uh, so it is really a phenomenon that is, is not just a one-off and then everything else would be constant. There's really considerable order of magnitude variability going on here. So that was an interesting finding. As I mentioned, we additionally had simultaneous Chandra observations to also try to answer this question, do these events uh, actually correlate with X-ray flares? Uh, to, uh, to some degree, are they coincident? Uh, so that was the second question we tried to answer. And there, that, that's where we ran into a lot of additional complexity, actually. That's uh, uh, quite fascinating and it's, it's really the first look at this, uh, at this phenomenon. We are looking at the same two sources here that I showed in the, in the previous plot, um, source 36 on the left-hand side and 515 on the right-hand side. You, you may remember the shape of the radio light curves in the upper panel. Again, red points there are, are upper limit in the upper panel. So we see this nice uh, sort of flare-shaped light curve on the left-hand side and this very strong flare on the, on the right-hand side. And the lower panels actually show the Chandra X-ray data. Now there's again quite a bit of information in this plot. It's on the same time axis as the, as the radio light curves. So you can directly compare the, the shapes of these light curves. The, the, black, um, the black data points shown in the, uh, in the lower panels are the actual binned X-ray photometry. The red uh, data points are the, the photon median energies. That's a nice aspect of X-ray astronomy that we can basically get uh, a median energy information as a first hint of any spectral changes 
uh, directly for uh, even as, as for a time series data set. And so that's actually, uh, if, you, if you only look at these, these black and red points, um, it doesn't look that spectacular on the left-hand side. There, there are some mild changes. Um, on the right-hand side, there's a bit more. Uh, you actually see for this big flare, this big radio flare, uh, that there's a corresponding increase in, uh, in the X-ray photometry as well. But there really is a lot more complexity. And this is where we used an adaptively smoothed light curve of the, since we can look at every individual photon in the X-ray light curve, this is shown in these blue confidence intervals. And that's where we suddenly see on the left-hand side that there is actually a relatively faint, uh, but uh, still a flare coincident with the radio flare. And on the right-hand side, it's actually interesting that there is also uh, this increase in X-ray Flux, uh, in X-ray flux uh, coincident with the radio flare, but there's a lot more going on. There's uh, something in X-rays as bright uh, as in this, in this big radio flare in the first, uh, in the first epoch when, when there was no radio detection at all. And then the source got even brighter in X-rays uh, on subsequent days. And it, it remained uh, detectable in the, in the radio, but uh, and not even close to this uh, to this flux density level as, as during the flare. So there's definitely more going on here, and there's there's a lot. We, we basically have the the work cut out for us here uh, uh, to make to make sense of this to maybe find types of variability here where, where uh, more quantitative comparisons can be done. Um, I will now. Uh, it, it present uh, one aspect of the slightly wider view. This is uh, a project that uh, Jaime Vargas Gonzalez is working on. Um, we basically took the central pointing for these light curves, and then we took adjacent pointings to, to uh, cover more of the of the X-ray sample of protostars in Orion. So that's shown here, and this new coverage is much greater. Um, uh, this is a work in progress. We, we're looking at the at the population properties here. One aspect I would like to point out is actually uh, one discovery that Jaime made early on. We found that even after just a few years, uh, we were detecting fast proper motions in some of the, the faint radio sources in the sample. And uh, this really helped us identify um, some objects or object types that we are, we are now detecting with the sensitive radio data that we did not detect before and where the, the, these fast motions really help us in the identification process. These are basically, um, at face value, uh, th these are basically proper motions of uh, several hundred kilometers per second. So that's something where we wouldn't really expect to see stars uh, except on, on, in very uh, exceptional circumstances. And it turned out these were actually uh, related uh, to the OMC one explosion. And we, can, we see some of the ejecta in the radio. And of course, with phase reference observations, there's very good astrometry. So even with just a few years time baseline, we were able to constrain the velocities here, uh, which is sometimes difficult on the optical if everything is moving and there's not really a, a fixed benchmark for the, for the astrometry. And this definitively allowed us to say that the, these radio sources are actually related to the, uh, uh, to the optical, uh, optically visible ejecta here. So that was one nice byproduct of, this, of these observations. Speaking of astrometry, what does this now mean uh, in terms of VLBI observations? This is something I, I said earlier that we, we would be looking at much greater resolution, higher astrometric precision, and this is indeed a technical aspect of these observations that is very interesting beyond even this question of perhaps resolving large magnetic structures, for example. So if we think back of VLBI observations as reaching sub-AU resolutions here in the ONC, uh, what do we actually get from such observations? So one thing to, to keep in mind is that we really get the closest uh, to uh, absolute astrometry uh, in, in astronomy overall by using phase reference observations to background quasars. Uh, 
we can, so we can observe uh, proper motions, parallaxes. Uh, we can we might be able to look for reflex motion uh, due to companions. Uh, I'm, I'm listing our Orion distance here just as an example. More work has been done also by Marina Kunkel uh, in this regard. That's there are some really nice examples for how one can use uh, VLBI observations with phase referencing for um, precision astrometry. One thing that really changed this for this project was that not only did the VLBA get better continuum sensitivity, but we can now use software correlation. And so it's no longer, we are no longer constrained to correlating one or a handful of sources we could actually correlate all 556 VLA sources uh, in these observations without having to decide a priori which of these are likely detections and which are not. Uh, so that's a very interesting aspect in terms of the census also of the non-thermal population. I mentioned earlier that we can use brightness temperature in, in VLBI observations uh, to look for non-thermal sources. So that's a really interesting aspect. And of course, all of this astrometry is uh, very complementary to Gaia and, for example, LSST programs, since uh, we are looking at, uh, at sources that are deeply embedded that may not be visible in the optical. And on top of that, uh, these observations are not um, impacted in, the, uh, in this area of the sky by the nebula, which is another problem uh, if, if you want to look at uh, optical astrometry here in the in the ONC because of the bright nebula. So here are, here's a quick summary of these considerations for why we added the VLBA to this, to this project. Um, we can actually look at more sources, with a, a large sample based on the, VLB, uh, the VLA sample. One goal initially is to, to look at absolute proper motions. Uh, we've been continuing these observations for a few years now and at some point everything is moving because we are now sensitive to motions of down to 0.1 kilometers per second. That's a, to some degree a direct search for binaries and companions in a parameter range that is otherwise difficult to access. We may occasionally hit some large magnetic structure that we are at least close to where this becomes meaningful. And of course there's also an overlap with Gaia that is actually a very interesting astrometric cross-check. Here's a quick look at uh, our first results. This is uh, also very recent work in progress. One uh, major surprise to some degree that we found in the, in, this, in the VLBA sample, now looking at four separate epochs, um, was pervasive variability. Now you might say, okay, we are already basically sensitive to non-thermal emissions, so this is not unexpected. Uh, but it, it, it was happening to a degree that, that surprised us to, uh, uh, to some extent. We basically found 123 non-thermal sources in the inner ONC from among the VLA sources. This is really an, an unprecedented non-thermal YSO population. But uh, from uh, using these four different epochs, most of them are only detected in one of them. This is shown on the, uh, in the histogram on the left-hand side here, where I show the number of nominal detections as a function of signal-to-noise cutoff, shown on the x-axis from 5.5 to 7.5. And then these different colors indicate the number of detections, where red is one out of four, green is two out of four, orange is three out of four, and only the blue bin indicates sources that have been detected four times out of four. And so you see that even at the highest signal to noise cutoff, most of the sources are actually just detected once, which is uh, an interesting corollary of this. Uh, on the right hand side, I'm showing uh, some first proper motions deduced from these uh, uh, VLBA observations, and we compared some of them where possible with Gaia, where there's a, actually a very good cross match. So th this will be interesting to, to bring into this context of Gaia proper motions, particularly after uh, uh, data release three. So that's really a, a nice uh, additional way of, of uh, looking at how pervasive non-thermal radio emission is toward these sources.
Now at toward the end, I also wanted to, uh, to mention Alma, and uh, this is to some degree a small step change here in a sense that we are now looking at the different frequency. We are looking at millimeter continuum emission, and we are looking for variability there. This is something that um, we worked on uh, while I was in Bonn actually uh, with Plateau de Brewer monitoring of a T tau binary system. Uh, where we deduce that, that we see synchrotron radiation in uh, the millimeter continuum. So this is different from what we would normally think Alma would trace when we look at a young stellar object. We are not just looking at, at dust emission, thermal emission, but we may actually be looking at high energy processes in this range. I'm also showing some radio spectra of the sun here, uh, where we see similar phenomena uh, that we might actually detect non-thermal millimeter emission from the from the sun. So that makes sense, but it's this is also something where with a lack of, of sensitivity and, and observational difficulties, it was very difficult to look for this in the millimeter range. There have been very few examples so far. And so one experiment uh, that we obtained was to see, to observe the same inner field of the ONC uh, with uh, ALMA and the three millimeter continuum as a starting point. Uh, this required uh, the long baselines to some degree, again, to get rid of the, the nebula as, as, as far as possible. And what you see here is actually what the innermost ONC looks like uh, in, in such a continuum observation. You again see lots of radio stars here, even though it's not a priori clear what the emission mechanism is here. These, these could be disk sources to some degree. Uh, and so the key to the high energy processes here is to look at variability. This is again work in progress, but I'm, I would like to show one first example. Uh, so if you look at shorter time scales, uh, things again start to look a little bit like uh, they did with the, uh, the, in the centimeter range. So you see sources appearing that are not detected at other times. And this will be, this is a nice uh, signature of uh, short time scale variability. Uh, th th this will be very interesting to quantify overall in terms of an occurrence rate. Okay, and this brings me to my summary. Um, I think a couple of radio upgrades uh, from the centimeter into the millimeter range are really providing us with a very different look at stellar radio astronomy and young stellar objects in particular. This is all ongoing. Uh, the Orion Nebula Cluster is really a nice benchmark in this respect, but of course we can do a lot more with uh, looking at more nearby sources, for example, with smaller samples. And uh, my hope really is that we will get uh, a more detailed look at high energy irradiation of YSO environments uh, as a result, while actually also having a first systematic look at YSO astrometry in the context of Gaia and really overall uh, a glimpse of the first glimpse of what the SKA will be able to do. Uh, so thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Jan, for this nice talk. And um, okay, now should be some clapping, but of course we cannot hear it. Anybody who want to make a question to Jan, please raise your hand in the chat box and I will open the micro to you. So here is one, Reiner. Reiner? I'll mute myself, sorry, I was still muted. So thank you very okay. much. Do you hear me now, everyone? Yep. Okay, so Jan, thanks a lot for giving this talk. Very good talk, very nice talk. Um, first of all, I would like to point out to all the listeners that Jan is the chair or one of the two chairs of the Our Galaxy Working Group for the SKA that uh, will focus in particular on galactic observations of the SKA, on radio stars, on galactic plane surveys. So if you are interested in that, please participate in that working group. Contact Jan and everyone. Um, second, I have a number of questions, although I must admit I'm not so much interested in the PMS stars, <laughs> but nevertheless, because I'm more in the main sequence stars. So you also have massive main sequence stars in Orion. Uh, 
are those stars also highly variable or are they more um, kind of constant? Is, do you constantly discover them at X-ray and radio? Or is yeah, that, that's actually, that's a very good question. That's, a, a, that's um, something that has been a puzzle for quite some time, actually. What are the high energy properties of the trapezium stars in particular? And it's still somewhat confusing. The, the main reason why this is confusing is that these are, of course, mostly multiple systems by themselves. And so it's actually hard to tell if you detect radio or X-ray emission uh, uh, toward these objects. Uh, is this now really due uh, to high mass stars or is it due to some low mass companion? Uh, that has been, there's been an ongoing debate for, for quite some time. We think that we see both actually. So we see some cases um, where it's, it's quite obvious, also based on a lot of previous work, that multiple systems are at play with low mass uh, companions that are probably responsible for most of the observed radio and, and to some degree X-ray emission. But we probably also detect at least one of the trapezium stars as a faint, more or less constant uh, radio source. This is uh, not the first time this has been done here, but there was actually a, a nice uh, confirmation of earlier results. Apparently, it is actually also detectable. It's a little bit difficult to put this into the full context at the moment uh, for what this means for, for high mass stars uh, overall. Okay, thank you very much. The so uh, are the high mass stars, so the, your pre-main sequence stars, are they typically brighter than the, than the, than the trapezium stars? Uh, typically, yes. Okay, that's very interesting. So you would say that the pre-main sequence stars make very bright targets typically, so, so they should be also easier detectable at great distances. Yes, indeed. I think that's actually an interesting uh, corollary of this, that the um, these are very radio luminous. And so this is partly what makes these, these VLBI experiments possible. Uh, and indeed, one may be able to, to detect those at, at greater distances. If, if you remember this plot that I showed in the beginning with the X-ray versus radio luminosity of stars, uh, the, the, the young stellar objects are really at the top end of this distribution. So among active stars, they are among the most uh, radio luminous. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have another question. Guillem, please. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yep. Hi, Jan, this is Guillem Anglada. Uh, thank you for the nice talk. And I will ask you uh, about these uh, ALMA detections of, of possible radio stars in, in, in Orion. Uh, whose uh, emission is unclear, the nature of, of the emission. Do you have some information on the spectral index, uh, even from the inside bandwidth or, or some kind of information just to constrain the, the nature of the, of the emission? Yeah, that's, uh, that, that would of course indeed be nice uh, to, uh, to have. My, my current impression is that this is probably inconclusive since the uh, the signal to noise for the sources where this is of interest is relatively low but i haven't fully explored yet uh, what we may be able to do um uh, taking everything we know about these sources into account of course this is a little bit difficult because if you if you see this on short time scales then uh, you may need to uh, constrain the analysis to that moment, and then mm -hmm. there will not be much more information to uh, to take into account. But I'm hoping that we can at least get some constraints. Okay, thanks. Um, here's a, another question from Mayra Osorio. This is Mayra Osorio. Hi, Jan. Thank you very much for this wonderful talk. I want to say that we have carried out a very deep a observation with VLA, VLA toward the ONT2 region. Oh, uh, we found uh, in several bands, some of our sources, actually we had detected about 70 sources, and uh, some of them 
are variable in radio, but not in infrared and X rays and vice versa. And these days I am trying to I am trying to find uh, which mechanisms produce the variability in radio and not in infrared. It seems to me that you had explained about this. Could you explain a little more, a little bit more about this topic? Why uh, sometimes the sources are variable in infrared or X-ray and not in radio and vice versa? Yeah, that's that's actually. Um, I think that's pretty much an open question. It's very interesting that you you observe this as well. Uh, this is also something I find very puzzling. So we have some sources in here. That's something I, I, I didn't explicitly mention, mm -hmm. where we see strong X-ray variability, yes. and the source doesn't even have a radio counterpart. Okay. And we also see some sources where there's strong radio variability, and the source does not have an X-ray counterpart. That's a subset of the sources, but a part. In this case, uh, uh, since the, the observations are simultaneous, there, there's there's little room to, uh, for the uh, uh, in, for sensitivity to play a role here, uh, even though to some degree that that's probably the explanation. So there there is more going on uh, that that will require a, a larger sample of these uh, phenomena to uh, to constrain what's what's happening. I think it would be good to know how often. This happens. How often do you see variability in one band but not another? Yes. You have a first overview of is this a significant fraction? Could this be some very special geometry, for example? Um, in terms of the mass accretion or the 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 impact of mass accretion that I mentioned, um, that's of course something that may not be as clean as it may have looked mm -hmm. in this initial plot that I showed, because in the end mass accretion could also be related to high energy processes mm -hmm. if you think of magnetospheric accretion so, so you might expect some, some high energy um, processes to play a role also in, in mass accretion and then this would again connect all these or three uh, metrics infrared variability x-ray variability and radio variability um, so i think the first step really is to to get a good overview of how often uh, this is happening yes. Thank you. In, thank you. In our case, we found a very small fraction of variable protestant in all the bands. A very, very small fraction in the case of ONC2 region. And the second question uh, that I can ask you is, which is the number of the extragalactic sources that you find in your field's view? I guess most of them are young protestants, but there must be a fraction of extragalactic sources. Could you provide these numbers just to compare with our region in or around ONT2 region? Yes, I don't have the exact number in, oh, okay. in mind now, but it's um, th there are a few extragalactic sources. So the uh, one aspect that helps us here is that. Uh, the overall sample is, is very well characterized in X-rays. And so whenever we have X-ray counterparts, uh, we can, uh, there's a very, very low contamination fraction from extragalactic sources. So the impact is a bit uneven across the sample, depending on what other information is, is available. Uh, it's, it, there are a few uh, um, of, of order 10 uh, extragalactic sources in there. But it's, it's, I think it's hard to compare this in a sense that the, uh, given the remnant complex structure that we see in the deep radio image, for example, the sensitivity is also uneven to, uh, to find background sources. Uh, so that would have to be taken into account. It's, it's not a clean uh, okay. noise background where we would only see faint point sources on top of it. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, we have another question, Miguel Perez Torres. Go on. Hi, uh, Jan. Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks again for the talk. Very useful. Um, my question uh, is related to the Goodell uh, to the Goodell plot that you initially showed, and actually, 
I'm wondering if you are now working on producing a, a new version of this plot, because if I understand, you have more than 500 sources that astrometrically you will be able to pick up and distinguish. And uh, I, I'm not sure how the Goodall plot was produced, to which extent they had simultaneous X-ray and, and radio observations, but you have now the capability, actually, even with the, this time, this time and precision, to see even to distinguish, you know, flare state from non flare state, and I think this could give a, a this could shed light on this, uh, you know, on, on some of these processes that we are still don't understand. I, 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 if I understood, we are still on the on the process of understanding how how this correlation fully fully applies, right? So, are you are you planning on producing this kind of plot, like let's say quiescent emission uh, versus non quiescent, and having let's say even two versions of this plot? Because again, I think some of these effects can be masked masked by by the fact that uh, you know you average and then you you lose the the the, the frame state or maybe the hardness ratio for the X-ray emission, and you can we can be mixed in not thermal and thermal processes can be reamassed. So I look forward to you know I hope you you will do this kind of work. Maybe you are already doing it. Yes, that's that's a very good point, and and you already uh, mentioned a couple of the uh, the, the stumbling blocks uh, on the way there to to uh, how to uh, take different uh, emission mechanisms into account. For example, uh, that is something that uh, is indeed in the in the works. One difficulty is if you think of the X-ray and radio light curves, where I showed these two examples, it it would really depend on so, so we could basically place the same source at multiple positions on this plot depending on the uh, on the time and so that will be an interesting aspect to see how does this play out with the the scatter of the of the empirical relation uh, you are right actually that the in the original relation it wasn't even possible to to use simultaneous observations so it is actually um amazing to see this correlation play out so well over so many orders of magnitude uh, based on these uh, on these non simultaneous data where now we could actually indeed place uh, some sort of light curve uh, in both x-ray and radio of these sources onto onto this plot so I, I i agree that there's there's more information in there on the on the underlying processes okay thank you thank you miguel there is a question by anton Please. Hi, Jan. Yeah. Thanks a lot for your talk. It was really, very nice. Yes, a very simple question. Uh, is there, uh, w which is the spectrum of the most variable stars? And the second one is, do you see a spectral evolution during the flares? Um, so so the, 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 the most extreme variability seems to be um, associated with negative spectral indices. Uh, we do see some signs of um, spectral evolution. The, the, the difficult part there is, is, is um, pinning down the spectral index uncertainty from the in-band spectral index, also with the varying synthesized beam shape uh, uh, throughout the, the observation. So that's why we haven't fully concluded on this yet, but I, I think that there is some evidence for a spectral index evolution in there. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you everybody. If there are any other question, no one is raising the hand. So I thank again Jan for this uh, talk. <coughs> and uh, well, we have a question, sorry. Isabel, yeah. No, that, that, this is not a question. I'm not an expert at all on this field, but I'd like just to thank again Jan, for accepting the invitation of the Serio to our program in these times that are especially difficult. And, um, and, and also with the complication of almost everybody being in, at holiday. So it, it, thank you very much. It's been very kind of you and congratulations for such a good talk. Thank you. And th thanks again for the invitation. It was a pleasure. Perfect. So it was officially said that, yes. that I want to say. Thank you very much, Jan, and I will stop recording now.